Uh, as Eric said, my name is Ben Kozak. I'm one of the cardiac intensivists at CHOP, and um, uh, I've been in, I've been able to um, join some of these conversations. I've really enjoyed them. I've learned a lot. Um, really enjoy, enjoyed the presentation by um, Saul Flores last week on point of care ultrasound and cardiac arrest. And um, I'm just uh, wanted to talk today in um, somewhat broad and then also somewhat specific um, terms about the use of point of care uh, ultrasound in the cardiac ICU, since I think it um, has a lot of overlap with some of um, POCUS use in other fields um, across the hospital, but um, has some um, unique characteristics as well. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, POCUS in the cardiac ICU, um, specifically um, how it is similar to and a bit different from um, point of care ultrasound in the PACU, NICU, uh, and ED, um, as well as other acute care settings. Um, we'll talk about um, some of the specific use cases um, germane to uh, CICU practice. Um, a, um, I'm in the pro column of uh, you know uh, the uh, debate on point of care ultrasound and the way it should be implemented and um, pretty much across the board. So I'll make an argument for cardiac intensivists um, becoming POCUS experts and um, also um, how we should be collaborating with uh, with our echo labs and also radiology colleagues. Um, I think um, those collaborations really um, uh, have a lot of potential to you know enhance the development of our uh, POCUS skills um, uh, rather than undercut them. So just a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of things about the cardiac ICU that I think most of you are aware of. You know, we have lots of neonates and infants. Nobody has a normal heart. Um, and that includes both intracardiac anatomy and as well as cardiac position, you know, within the thorax. Um, nobody has normal lungs. There's lots of bleeding everywhere. Um, Procedures, um, you know, procedural uses being one of the main applications of point of care ultrasound procedures are more difficult in small and malperfused babies. Um, our patients are often anticoagulated. Um, and, you know, cardiac surgery has um, um, some specific complications um, that uh, I think are well, um, are well evaluated uh, with point of care ultrasound. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that uh, in the cardiac ICU, even more so than in any of the other um, arenas in which POCUS is practiced, you know, there are multiple invested parties, including cardiac intensive care, cardiac anesthesia, cardiac surgery, interventional cardiology, and all of those people are uh, echocardiography, and all those people are constantly coming together to talk about um, what the best next steps are for patients. And so um, there's pretty constant, you know, bi-directional information transfer, and that has to be taken into account when um, uh, when acquiring new information, and um, particularly if you're acquiring it in a way that um, other folks in your institution um, uh, aren't necessarily accustomed to. As far as um, similarities with critical care, um, pediatric critical care ultrasound, um, and neonatal ultrasound, you know, we look for we look for many of the same things. You know, our patients in the cardiac ICU are um, certainly susceptible to pneumothorax, and we evaluate it by ultrasound the same way that everybody else does. Um, the um, uh, as you can see, you know, as you can see here, you know, M mode distinction of uh, a sort of a seashore versus a barcode pattern. We have patients uh, with pleural uh, effusions all the time, and um, and use ultrasound to um, both identify the size of that fluid, the location and characteristics of that fluid, um, and then also um, also drain it. The same is true for the abdomen um, in this patient with um, uh, peritoneal uh, significant peritoneal fluid. You know, often relief of that fluid is not just um, for the purposes of temporary um, reduction of intra-abdominal pressure or relief of fluid, but um, may allow us to supplement um, poor renal fluid removal in patients with uh, with fluid overload via um, uh, peritoneal passive peritoneal drainage, if not peritoneal dialysis. Obviously, there's some particulars about the um, about the the techniques there. Um, this is a massively distended bladder in a patient with severe agitation and hypertension, um, recognition of which um, allowed us to um, quickly manage the problem um, and restore the patient's um, 
uh, hemodynamics. You can imagine a, a severe urinary retention in a patient, uh, which was in this patient pharmacologically induced in a patient with poor LV function, uh, who then ends up with severe hypertension is uh, can be a big deal. Um, and sometimes the answer is really simple if you um, uh, if you know what to look for. Also, of course, allows we're constantly, as in all parts of critical care, worried about urine output and use urine output as a as a very important metric of, um, of uh, cardiac output and uh, adequacy of perfusion. And so in many cases, when you have a patient with poor urine output, we use point of care ultrasound to distinguish between the patient with poor urine output um, and the patient with adequate urine output, but um, poor urine, uh, you know, poor elimination um, as, uh, as that is very important for determining, you know, the patient's physiology or understanding the patient's physiology. The, um, I thought I would share a challenging case. Um, this is a, um, this young man was uh, about uh, five years old. No, I'm sorry. He was, um, he was, he was four years old um, and uh, underwent Fontan a little later than we usually do it. Um, he, as you can tell by the ECMO cannulae, wasn't doing particularly well. Um, had had um, his Fontan initially um, performed, um, had had some bleeding both uh, in the airway and in the pleural spaces, had um, but was man managed to get out of the operating room, and then fell apart on the first uh, into the second po uh, first postoperative day with um, severe respiratory um, severe respiratory failure. Um, he had an X-ray that looked like this. He went to the OR. He got um, um, sorry, he went uh, back to the OR and uh, and got revised uh, after being cannulated to ECMO in the cardiac ICU. The in the operating room um, with the help of um, uh, with the help of echo and a catheterization along the way, um, he was identified to have severe uh, severe obstruction to pulmonary venous egress on the left. Um, and, um, so when he went to the cath lab and then into the OR, he was, um, uh, he was bronched, found to have both blood and casts in his airway. Um, he was continued to be, he was, um, he was revised the pulmonary veins on the left side, which were complicated in this patient with an underlying heterotaxy were revised. The Fontan baffle was moved so that it wouldn't rest on the veins. The patient was brought back out to the cardiac ICU on ECMO and supported, um, uh, for another, um, for several more days. But without getting into the long and chronic nature of this patient's course, it was, it was important to know that even after going to the operating room, bronching the patient, trying to vac clear the airway out in the operating room of some blood and cast material, um, trying to cleaning, washing everything out as thoroughly as they can. When the patient got back to the operating room, um, we saw this develop. It sort of evolved over a couple of chest x-rays, but it developed, it was, um, it never, the lung was never really up and then pretty quickly came, went back to sort of complete a pacification as you see there. And so we've got this Fontan on ECMO with one lung down who's not going, whose hemodynamics won't tolerate coming off of the ECMO circuit um, with this sort of, with this um, degree of uh, cardiopulmonary compromise. And um, the, the question on the table um, when the surgeon approached me with about this patient was, well, what are we, um, you know, what are we going to, do I think um, you know this is about like should we wash this kid out? Should we um, uh, is this is this a lung problem? And because um, really on on serial X-rays it wasn't at all apparent. Um, and so the patient and the patient had been through a lot. There was concern that washing the kid back out would uh, invoke uh, sorry would provoke um, additional um, major bleeding um, that could be compromising. And so we really. Um, the question as to whether or not the airways were the problem or the um, the pleural space were the problem was the problem uh, you know was an important um, thing to determine in the kids and and figuring out the next steps in the kids management. So um, um, so ultrasound obviously came up as the next uh, logical diagnostic step, and these were images that we took uh, at the bedside of this patient's left chest. And I'll just play that one more time. So this is um, a coronal, uh, a coronal view up towards sort of the mid to apical uh, lung fields, and this is a more transverse view, sort of posteriorly uh, in a transverse orientation. Actually, 
um, the um, so what given this patient that had a ton of had, had quite a bit of pulmonary hemorrhage and the fact that he'd also had some degree of um, bleeding from the chest tubes it wasn't really clear what we you know it was difficult to interpret these images and try to decide like is this really chewed up beat up lung or is this um, a collect you know a collection of blood in the um in the pleural space we lean towards the the former in other words um i'm sorry the latter and the collection of you know blood products in the pleural space but it was difficult to determine um uh with uh you know with a high degree of certainty so i think this is a place where we can talk where we you know leverage our um our collaborations with our radiology colleagues the um you know, uh, not every center maybe has, um, uh, every center has a different workflow. Um, we're fortunate, and I think it's uh, to have an ability to send our images, um, you know, upload them to PACS from our point of care machine. And so we did that and then, you know, call it, directly called down to the um, ultrasound uh, attending down to radiology who was on and reviewed the images uh, with her. And, you know, just said, you know, hey, look, I think that this patient has, um, uh, plural bleeding, but I'm not sure that they don't also have a lot of airway bleeding. Can you help me figure out, discern, you know, discern the 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 problem here? And can you help, help me figure out like what to do next? Because I don't want to open this kid up and then provoke a, a lot of additional bleeding if this is mostly an intraparenchymal problem. And she agreed that our with our interpretation that this was mostly a bunch of coagulated stuff in the pleural space for a variety of reasons that we could, you know, for a number of reasons that we could talk about, but that particularly the inability to distinguish um plural markings and the inability to um distinguish nor normal lung architecture and so after talking talking to the radiologist i felt much more confident in go talking speaking to the attending surgeon and saying look we're um you know i do think i do think we go need to go uh wash this patient out even though it's gonna um it, it may cause some problems and so that's what we did and we were actually and we were able to get the lung up it didn't stay up um for very long but at least as far as the um acute management it's um i thought it was just a good example of how these images aren't always super pristine and they can be pretty ugly and how um uh, speaking with radiology can be um, collaborating with radiology over one's own images can be um, can be really um, uh, helpful and, and instrumental. The they came up and took some of their own images as well and corrob which uh, which corroborated ours. Um, do um, I can uh, before we move on? Um, do others have um, uh, sort of similar experiences? Do others have the uh, ability to? upload their images, collaborate with radiology over those images. How does that um how does that work in um how does that work in y'all centers? Um then the I think it's a, it's a huge um advantage in terms of being able to apply some of your the, these modalities to to clinical practice, I, I mean, oftentimes I'm just showing images on the machine to um, to my, uh, to you know other specialties, but being able to transmit is a is a huge advantage. Um, I guess it's a little bit of a hard form to sort of take a show of hands, but I I'd love to um, I'd love to know sort of how um, how often people are able to sort of enlist radiology and how supportive radiology is in different people's institutions for um not just cardiac <clears throat> center imaging but other imaging around the hospital it's been um i i find it extremely helpful from education and for um you know corroborating our findings but i know it's not i know a lot of centers are not um set up that uh quite in that way and that it may even be difficult to get a radiologist to look at an image that they didn't themselves obtain yeah i agreed and i think um I mean, our article lab is we're we're uh, we're trying to um, mobilize our our pack system for a for multidisciplinary use. Uh, has our article lab has very been very interested in being able to share. But um, oh uh, yeah, I have to say, like most places I've, I've been, the that interaction has not been that well developed. The um, cool. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm gonna jump back into the slides here.
All right, so I wanted to talk for a few minutes about um, some unique CICU applications that um, um, I think are certainly of interest to me, um, and I think of interest to others in the field of cardiac critical care, but have some uh, carryover into um, uh, in, in utility in other fields of, uh, of pediatric critical care medicine as well. Um, one that's um, near and dear to my heart, as Eric mentioned, is um, uh, using ultrasound for vascular access, uh, specifically um, ultrasound guided uh, umbilical venous cannulation. We all use ultrasound for vascular access of all forms, um, I think more or less all the time. If you're um, uh, still doing it by landmark techniques, you're probably not in this meeting. Um, but the uh, we um, recently have been able to um, uh, we're excited to be able to describe a technique for using ultrasound for placing uh, ultrasound for placing umbilical lines using ultrasound guidance. We had a we've, we had a we have a pretty substantial problem not just the chop but in the field um, in general with um, uh, umbilical venous catheters not going where you want them to go. It's about a about a half to a third of the a third to half of the time depending on what paper you read and when you do the survey. But um, it's a for when you have patients who rely on these catheters for perinatal and perioperative um, management, it's um, um, it's a it's a big issue, and it's particularly when you know if you're in a center um, where you don't have ready access to a, a team of neonatal uh, neonatal PIC experts. Even if you do, um, PICs neonatal PICs, as you guys know, um, aren't great for rapid transfusion of volume and blood products, and so um, we put a pretty high premium on the uh, umbilical line in the cardiac ICU. Um, they often, though, you know, do this and kind of hook off into the right or left uh, portal veins instead of going uh, where you want them to go. Um, these uh, illustrations depict the anatomy of a properly positioned umbilical venous cannula that's come up through the UV, through the portal sinus, through the ductus venosus, and up into the heart um, versus one that's gone off and lodged in a left-sided portal vein or a right-sided portal vein, uh, as you can see down here. The um, it's I, I could talk all day about this and I won't, but I think um, really what I'd like to show you in a few slides is how you can use uh, ultrasound to uh, to evaluate this, understand the anatomy, and then get the catheter um, positioned where you uh, where you want it to be. Um, so the positioning is um, like this, generally speaking. Um, I um, uh, babies, I put up diaper. What's that? Not, not, not. Huh? No, no, no. Sorry, we have yeah. talk. So the um, so you just um, you know, secure the baby. Um, I usually use this sort of compression tape and a little papoose of diapers around the legs, and they honestly and a you know blanket over the arms, and they honestly don't mind this too much at all. They um, they kind of just chill once they're um, once they're stably positioned. And I do this because I like to do a wide prep from sort of the nips to the hipples and basically all the way across the width of the um, uh, the chest because it gives you a nice window for imaging sterilely while you're uh, while you're manipulating your catheter. So we'll prep through here, image, and image through um, uh, through the liver, sort of uh, generally speaking in the midline, plus or minus a little bit. Um, these are the um, these are the probes that I prefer for this. The cardiac phase array probes are great for va evaluating vessel patency, color Doppler, and things like this. But for actual procedures, um, I think the linear array transducers give you much better temporal and spatial resolution. So I tend to use a wider, uh, sort of larger format linear array. I'm vendor agnostic. We um, these are just stock images that happen to be GE. Um, I think um, the nice thing about these larger probes is you can actually sort of use it underneath your hand to manipulate the belly and do some of the same manipulations that neonatologists have done forever when trying to get umbilical lines in place, but you can actually do it. You can actually see what you're doing while you're doing it. Um, so again, um, uh, you start with the tra uh, with a sagittally oriented transducer, um, basically sub-xiphoid um, in the midline. 
um, takes up a fair amount of space on the belly, but it gives, that means that it, but you get a nice imaging window and those sorts of transducers, those larger format or medium frequency linear probes um, allow you to basically see through the whole baby. Um, of course, in a small, which is great, in a smaller baby, of course, you might want to do something uh, closer to a hockey stick. But um, so just if you think about the orientation of the anatomy here, the umbilicus is midline, the IVC and right atrium are slightly right of midline. And so the imaging plane that captures mo those things is basically sagittal, but then um, rotated a little bit uh, to the left or counterclockwise. Um, I found that if you um, slide the um, uh, slide the probe a bit to the uh, to the patient's left, and then angle back, tilt the uh, the beam back towards the patient's right, um, that you um, you line up the relative the relevant structures. Uh, nicely, but every patient's a little different and you just have to take us a, a couple of minutes to um, to get the alignment uh, that you want. Um, for orientation, this is what it looks like by, um, this is what an umbilical venous catheter looks like in a cross table or lateral radiograph. Um, you can see it coming from the umbilicus up top um, to the heart. Um, other landmarks include the diaphragm, the endotracheal tube, the umbilicus up there. Here's the umbilical arterial catheter um, in the aorta, just anterior to the diaphragm, and here's the umbilical venous catheter here. Um, so when you um, place an ultrasound, an ultrasound transducer on the belly in the, the um, uh, subxiphoid uh, location, again, sagittally oriented, you get an image that looks kind of like this. And I would start, if you're going to do these, of course, just always welcome to call me and we'll talk through it. But I think um, if you're going to start, when you start out, just practicing evaluating these catheters when they're, when they are in situ and correct and correctly positioned um, goes a long way towards developing the, the muscle memory. But your image looks like this. And so here's the heart up here. Here's the liver down. Um, here's the liver down all the way through here. And here's the catheter coming from the, through the umbilicus through the portal sinus and through the ductus venosus. The hepatic veins are here. Um, before you start, it's obviously helpful to know that the vessel you're interested in, in this case, the ductus venosus is patent. And so you can evaluate that with colored Doppler or with um, uh, injection of agitated saline or just suck up a little bit of blood, mix it with saline, inject it back in. And that will give you um, a nice demonstration of uh, a vessel patency. When umbilical catheters are malpositioned, they tend uh, to be lodged in portal veins. And so portal veins have an echo-bright endothelium as opposed to an uh, echo, uh, sort of this uh, rel relatively indistinct echo uh, endothelium that you see in the hepatic veins. And so in this case, an umbilical venous catheter is um, being passed through the umbilical vein. And as you try to get down into the portal sinus here to the ductus venosus, it's getting stuck in this, um, in this left side of portal vein here. So there's the tip of the catheter stuck in that left portal vein. Um, what you want is for it to go this way instead. So um, again, catheter here, tip in the left pulmonary vein here, pulmonary sinus, ductus venosus, and then again, portal sinus, catheter where you want across the ductus venosus um, coming into the right atrium just, um, uh, just south of the um, uh, insertion of the hepatic veins. So I'm going to show you now how you do improve, um, how ultrasound can assist you in improving the alignment of these vessels and navigating the catheter through the um, umbilical vein to the portal sinus and the ductus venosus. And so again, here are those vessels. Here are a couple of left-sided portal veins. Here's the portal sinus. Um, here's the ductus venosus. Here's the portal sinus here. Here's the ductus venosus. It looks a little bit different in these two images because they're slightly different imaging planes. The ductus venosus, I'm sorry, the portal sinus arcs from... Um, it sort of arcs posteriorly and then rightward um, to meet up with the right side of portal veins, whereas the ductus venosus tends to be a little bit more leftward often. And so you, relative, uh, relatively speaking, as far as its takeoff here, and so you can often get left portal veins and ductus venosus and portal sinus in one view, or you can get um, portal sinus and right portal veins in one view, but it's hard to get them all. So um, so here is, this is the view that you, um, that is most useful for doing this procedure. And what you'll find, right, is that the catheter wants to lodge here. Um, instead of coming down here and making a turn off, it'll lodge in a left side of portal vein, such as this. It will arc to go too far and end up in a right portal vein like so. Um, the um, ideal would be if it went 
like that and sort of made this sweeping S turn into the portal in, um, into the ductus venosus. But that's hard to do. And it's the catheter is usually less excited about doing that than it is about doing any of these other things. And so at least in kids who have had a difficult um, or unsuccessful position uh, placement attempt um, prior to uh, prior to your ultrasound guided attempt. Um, what happens though, is if you press down on the belly with ultrasound, it compresses these vessels and it makes it harder for the catheter to go into them. It makes the turn into the right portal veins much more acute instead of sweeping. Um, and it um, and it aligns, it flattens this S turn here to to so that the um, the catheter can more easily be navigated um, directly to uh, where you want it to go. So we did a pilot study of this um, at um, uh, at three centers. Um, we did a bunch of them at CHOP, um, uh, Mount Sinai. We also are collaborators at, at Mount Sinai and um, and Stanford. Um, did um, did a number as well. So uh, many thanks to. Um, uh, Alan Groves, uh, Courtney Giuliano, and um, and Shazia Bambal. I think many of you probably know them. Um, but what we found was that in 32 kids across three centers, most of whom were term and most of whom were of reasonable weight, although some were small, um, that um, if we um, that we could take kids who had had failed umbilical venous catheter placement and convert them or rescue them from from failed to successful um, in about 72% uh, of cases. And then if we got to it in the first 24 hours of life, we were successful um, about 80% of the time. So um, uh, we were pretty excited about this. And it, um, the improvement rate we found, uh, uh, interestingly, sort of mirrored um, the, uh, the improvement in success that we saw in pediatric critical care when we went from landmark technique to ultrasound guided technique uh, the standard of care in, um, uh, um, in excuse me, central venous uh, line placement as well. So, um, little, um, uh, be excited to talk with any of you guys about this if you're, uh, if it would be relevant to your practice. I'd also like to talk. Uh, so, just moving on from that, I think um, we also have um, sort of an interesting constellation of. Um, uh, modes of respiratory failure in the cardiac uh, intensive care unit, which are a little bit different than what we see in um, in other units. And so um, um, I'd like to touch on two of those, one of which is um, evaluation of the upper airway or um, specifically the vocal cords, and the other is uh, evaluation, evaluation of diaphragm movement. The reason that both of these are um, so pertinent to our practice in the cardiac ICU is that um, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and phrenic nerve injury are um, high up on the list of um, uh, morbidity-inducing complications of cardiac surgery. Um, Eric is much more of an expert in um, vocal fold uh, ultrasound than uh, than I will ever be, but um, we are starting to get our um, uh, get our heads around it, um, and it's um, and so far have found it uh, have found it useful. Um, there are some papers um, on this in the field. Um, uh, the group in uh, in Houston is certainly, um, I think, leading the charge, but um, others are starting to, uh, including us, are starting to follow suit. Um, this, um, these are just obviously screenshots of a couple of abstracts uh, highlighting the fact that this is a um, an important uh, problem in um, in congenital heart surgery. Uh, vocal for vocal when arch surgery when the arch is operated on. Um, the rate of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and vocal cold, vocal fold um, dysfunction is um, is not uh, is not low, um, and the uh, rate of aspiration associated with that is also not low, um, uh, despite which uh, it um, is often uh, it's often silent. So you can do this. Um, so you can evaluate the cords uh, quite nicely with ultrasound. It's um, the, the um, the technique is, um, you know, takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's um, it, it's not overly bothersome to the patient. Um, you basically just take, um, uh, I use uh, particularly, I usually use a hockey stick type probe, although I imagine others might use something different. I think Eric, that's what you use as well, right? Oh, the, you're using great. The, we use the exact same machine. We had had a. Um... Uh, the small linear is like an L1022 uh, that's only about 
uh, one and a half centimeters long in face length, but really thin. So it fits into the, the crease really well, just like a hockey stick would. Um, the larger linears can also be used, you know, like the standard vascular access linear, but um, yeah, it's nice to have, have a small, small footprint linear if, if possible for, for the, for the babies for this. I've um cool. Yeah, we've I've tried it with the 1022 and also the um hockey stick, like the 818. I um the thing I kind of like about the hockey stick is the you know the ergonomics lets you hold it against the kids, you know, hold it up under the kids um jaw in a in a way that's um I, I found it was easier to manipulate the probe uh that way. It's um but either way, the um you can get good images. Um they're obviously not always incredibly easy to interpret but um they were i was pleasantly surprised that you can um you can you can see what you see what it is that you um that you're looking for in um i think in most cases so um this is a patient with normal vocal fold movement and you can see as the cords come together um i'll just play it and then i'll sort of explain it so but you can can you guys see here there's you know one vocal fold here and one vocal fold here and they sort of make a v when they come together those become one thick line in the middle and then you see a horizontal um uh sort of a horizontal line where excuse the background noise my children are apparently killing each other um the um where the um uh the posterior um uh, arytenoids have um, have come together. So I'll play that again, and you'll be able to see. So see here where you, the arytenoids have uh, come together, and the um, still a little bit of uh, here you see that echo bright stripe. Um, when the patient's crying, you'll see it light up nicely with um, some air artifact as well, um, and sort of a reverberation artifact. But the um, Eric, correct me if I'm describing anything incorrectly, but um, this is good um, apposition of the vocal cords. No, it's, that's perfect. I think you've, you've captured a lot of the relevant imaging really well because sometimes it's very hard to see the back of the of the larynx, but you've got it from front to back really nice. You've kind of you've got it centered in the middle of the view. You can see the, with those little yellow hour, uh, hourglasses on the side that the focal zones are right in the in the middle of the of the larynx. Um, yeah, you, you picked up a you know a, a lot of the the relevant pathology. The sometimes you get some air shadow like right there. Um, yep. And when you get kind of like that circular air air shadow like you're seeing there, you know that you have to go up a little a little bit higher uh, to to try to get into the folds because you're probably seeing you know the top of the trachea. But no, th this is great. Great. Um, thank you. And then so this is a patient who had. Um, I'm just going through the archives today, trying to um, come up with some good examples. But this is a patient who had a, um, well, I won't tell you. Take a look and see if you can decide what this patient had. And then as far as um, an abnormality, and then, I'll, then we'll talk about it. What do folks think? Yeah, that's a really nice example of uh, of, of uh, vocal fold fold immobility on the on the left side. Thinking that yeah, this is oriented with the patient's right yep. to the left of the screen. Yep. Yeah, so can you guys see that? So see in this one, the um in this one, the the chords move symmetrically, right? It goes from like this T shape to this V shape pretty symmetrically as the patient takes a breath. Here, the right vocal fold moves nicely, and this vocal fold stretches out. But the left doesn't move very much over here. You'll see this area re stay relatively static. And you never and you never get that really nice bright white line of apposition. So um, I think so. We've been doing this more and more. I think it's um, it's not part of the routine workflow uh, as yet, but I think um, I think we'll get there. Um, 
it's, you know, I guess one question that remains is, um, you know, to what extent the, um, the diagnosis of vocal fold immobility um, is, um, uh, is important in the determination of, you know, aspiration after cardiac surgery. We all associate it that way and we all think it's important and we all know that it's an important thing to diagnose. Um, but as far as um, patient's ability to silently aspirate with normal vocal fold function, vocal cord movement, or, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, that's, um, uh, that's also a problem. And so, um, you know, what the comprehensive airway evaluation should be, I guess, is, um, you know, is, remains sort of to be determined. But I think this is an important part of it. Eric, do you have any, do you have any additional thoughts on, on that? Oh, in, in terms of the overall um, evaluation stuff? Uh, in, well, yeah. I think that I, there's just some, there's some literature that, you know, patients after cardiac surgery even can, you know, aspirate even with normal vocal fold movement and that patients with, um, uh, so I think um, just wondering, like, in your, so in your practice, you guys are probably the, you guys are the leaders in this. So uh, what do you, um, how do you incorporate this evaluation into your um, into your workflow and your patients? Uh, th thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate. It. Yeah, with the, with the evaluation and everything, um, we th there's some really interesting work that one of our, our one of my our fellows um, Ernesto Fernandez did at uh, uh, one of my previous centers, and he is looking at publishing this soon. But it just I, when you incorporate this into your workflow for looking at at vocal fold immobility. You find that of course you deploy ultrasound much faster than you do um traditionally in t uh, evaluation thing is like you know not every as you know not every kid who has mo immobility has a functional deficit that leads to you know major issues whether aspiration or persistent you know laryngeal insufficiency so uh that you know ultimately you know we we get better at, at figuring out that there's that that paralysis but like in terms of like or a tangible outcome on on the patient were probably equivalent to laryngoscopy, like you know fiber optic, but like the ultimate impact on the patient seems like right now we're we're um, not seeing a, a lot of change. The the benefit, of course, though, is just that you you can just get it out and and go for it. You know, if if it's like um, if it's like a situation where you might might find a little help, well, a, a little difficulty in. Being able to get your ENT evaluation soon enough, sometimes it's 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 uh, helpful, and you know the ENTs when they see it, they they're convinced as well. So I mean, it helps it helps tailor their evaluation as well. So uh, it, a little bit of a long answer, but the the it seems like the you know if 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 um, moving people along is is a benefit, then the then it does play play a big factor in terms of overall overall outcome. I think we still um, we're still trying to figure that out. Thank you. I see Saul has his hand up. Hey, Saul. Hey, what's up? My my only comment to that would be, um, would it make a difference how the vocal cord is paralyzed? If it's adducted versus abducted. Uh, and, and I think this would be, because we tend to code that, right? Like if it's nerpraxia, it's going to take six months. I remember, you know, I, I remember looking at that and the duration of the injury because they don't, for the most part, they're not going to divide or dissect the nerve. It just paralyzes, it and then eventually you'll get function, functional recovery. But um, but I remember that in in my PQ days, we used to comment on the on the type of vocal cord paresis or paralysis, and this would be, I think, doing it in a systematic way would be a, a neat way of being able to say see whether there's any association with the type of vocal cord paralysis. Because to me, it makes sense, right? Like if you have if you have a vocal cord, that, a fold that is paralyzed in the closed position, the, pa the patient may have intermittent or persistent extrathoracic strider, but not aspirate versus the one that doesn't have strider, but has silent aspiration because the vocal cord is open. So there you go, a little idea, comment. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be a lot to be talked about there, and um, it's an it's exciting way that we can um, 
a way that we, I think our cardiac patients can benefit from point of care ultrasound. Um, additionally, um, our patients have a higher than typical incidence of um, respiratory failure due to uh, diaphragm dysfunction. Um, and um, that's, um, you know, an area that um, where um, POCUS has been gaining ground um, sort of across pediatric uh, critical care. Um, the um, Mark Weber and uh, crew put together a nice uh, review of this um, last year, um, which includes some uh, some slides. Uh, I mean, some uh, nice figures on uh, on technique, and um, uh, you know, more recently, um, some groups are starting to um, try to utilize point of care ultrasound um, evaluation of the diaphragm um, as a um, as a tool to predict. Uh, extubation failure, sort of a, um, you know, the uh, sonic sonograph equivalent of a, an extubation, an extubation readiness test. And so um, I think this is um, given the fact that lots of our kids have um, uh, diaphragm, uh, phrenic nerve injury, diaphragm dysfunction, and that it's not always apparent uh, when the patient is invasively ventilated with positive pressure. Um, the, this sort of, uh, this sort of workflow, a test like this, um, uh, stands to be um, uh, potentially uh, very useful in our patients. I don't know that you would do it on every patient prior to uh, first attempt at extubation, um, but um, uh, in reops for sure, uh, patients with difficult dissections, patients with diaphragms that are up on uh, on X-ray, um, or, or in whom you had another specific concern, I think, um, uh, or patients who had already failed extubation once, this could allow you to um, uh, extubate them with the uh, in a bit of a more informed uh, way with respect to the support um, onto which you um, liberate them from mechanical ventilation and um, uh, and predict their ability to, uh, to fly or not. So I think um, this, these are just some of the, um, a couple of the figures from, uh, from that paper, um, just showing how you can look both um, from a, a sort of a lateral thoracic view at the zone diaphragm uh, zone of apposition um, and measure both movement, you know, diaphragm translation and also uh, thickening. Uh, this is in the sort of this uh, lateral thoracic view. Um, and this is, um, as you can see up at the top, um, evaluation from a, uh, from a subcostal view, both of which are possible. Now, you know, I've spent 40 minutes talking about um, ultrasound in the cardiac ICU, but I haven't really talked about the 800-pound um, the gorilla in the room, which is um, cardiac, um, cardiac sonography uh, at the bedside in cardiac patients. I think the um, there's, uh, there's a lot to sort of unpack here, and I think there are... Um, I don't think we're going to solve it today, but um, hope we're hoping to solve it um, over the next year or two, or at least move the conversation forward over the next year or two. Um, I think there are pros and cons to this uh, to the debate here. I don't, although I'm in the pro camp, I don't um, I don't want to suggest that there aren't um, counterbalancing factors that need to be considered. You know, I think in the to lay it out in terms of a pro con list, I think most cardiac intensivists are board certified cardiologists, maybe not all, but uh, maybe, but at least half. Um, and so the um, these are folks who are uh, have a strong foundation in ultrasound, have a strong foundation in echo. Um, and then so then when you take that and you couple it with the fact that as the person most um, intimately familiar with what's going on with that patient at that time, you know, not only do you um, I ho hopefully know what you're looking at, but you also know what you're looking for. And I think that allows you to get the information you need quickly. Um, and sometimes, you know, when kids are unstable, um, we just need the, inf the information, you know, right now. And so I think there, um, I think there's a, I think there's a, there's a role for this. And I think we have to, I think we have to um, develop it and uh, build it out in a way that um, everybody is, can get behind and is comfortable with, but um, I think it's, um, I think the, um, I think the train has left the station and we need to just um, um, figure out how to, how to best management, manage it. I think it's, it's a little bit ironic that um, the cardiac ICU is the most imaging heavy ICU, you know, across the hospital and in most institutions, but um, that we're a little late to the game on 
uh, on point of care ultrasound in part because, you know, as a field, in part because um, echo has been um, the domain of, um, you know, a different division within the departments of cardiology. But I, um, but I think the foundation is there and I think the, the time is ripe to be doing this. I think on the con, the con side, though, just to acknowledge the important counterpoints, um, you know, it is true that sometimes we don't have enough time to get uh, the detailed information that's, uh, you know, super detailed information um, that's needed. I think, you know, the um, sometimes we have to answer a very focused question and then not pretend like we got the whole picture and call somebody else in to sort of at the a time that's that's feasible um, for the patient and the and the imaging providers get additional information. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, we th realize that, you know, while we may be mobilizing resources in support of a patient, the we may also we also need to be careful that we're not inappropriately mobilizing resources and you know and sort of making the wrong call. So we need to. So there's a there's a, a really a strong opportunity for collaboration here. I think um, to improve our skill set um, and to also um, you know collaborate across the multidisciplinary um, providers in cardiac center in the you know today's cardiac center to um, to get the right information um, to make decisions but i think in my in my opinion in my experience the benefits of of this technology in the cardiac icu far outweigh the risks um it's in some ways maybe it's a question of scope right i think um while um i think you know most people don't argue with um the um the, the idea that um um a provider with ultra, some ultrasound experience in the PICU or the NICU or the emergency department can um, uh, adequately obtain and interpret images related to ventricular function um, and pericardial and pleural fluid. Where um, where I think we can do more in the cardiac ICU includes you know RV pressure, valve function, outflow tract obstruction, other post-operative um, uh, other um, you know, important post-operative um, residua, and then of course ECMO cannulae, which we have in um, uh, which many of our patients, um, uh, uh, which many of our patients have in um, uh, either in the usually in the uh, either in the neck or in the chest, but um, are um, certainly as um, Saul talked about some last week, and as other, others have talked about, um, are are very much uh, amenable to um, ultrasound imaging and. Uh, often um, need to be assessed in a very time sensitive way. I think there's there's more to be um, there's more to be discussed there, more to be explored. Um, we have um, put together a um, multi-institutional group of cardiac intensive care providers who are interested in point of care ultrasound and have um, uh, a survey that was just approved by PCICS to go out this uh, this coming cycle. So um, uh, many of you will hopefully be getting it in your inbox and uh, thank you in advance for your um, taking a few minutes to uh, fill it out. We're aiming to um, uh, understand the current patterns of use in cardiac ICUs um, as well as um, do a needs assessment, understand what the challenges have been so that we can kind of move that we can help um, uh, move the field forward uh, on this um, uh, on this important technology. So just in um, in summary, I think um, our patients are really complicated. Um, um, that, uh, but uh, despite that complexity, there are, uh, are um, opportunities to improve patient care uh, through rapid point of care diagnosis and treatment. They're not so complicated that um, we um, can't make some of these determinations, uh, you know, ourselves. I think pretest probability is important in decision making, and we kind of um, are. Arch, um, arch surgery and evaluating for um, airway um, for vocal fold um, uh, dysfunction, for example, um, um, airway bleeding or pleural bleeding and evaluating um, and helping to contextualize um, a difficult uh, to interpret pleural, um, you know, thoracic ultrasound. Um, I think it's um, clear to me that cardiac point of care uh, ultrasound can be undertaken and collaborate and Everybody has, has access to all of the information all of the time. 
um, and can um, and work together based on that information. Um, and um, I think it uh, is also important to leverage one's echo and radiology colleagues um, to enhance one's own learning and improve um, one's imaging and interpretation, especially in uh, difficult cases. Because sometimes direct conversations are, um, you know, as you know, can be worth a tremendous amount. So um, I'd like to wrap it up there and leave, you know, five or ten minutes for questions. And um, of course, happy to continue the conversation um, uh, offline at uh, whenever would uh, whenever it work for you guys. So um, thanks very much.